platform, but you feel free. Uh, you're among friends and uh, we're here for an hour to talk. Uh, we'll be starting in a short while. Okay. Rosel, welcome, Rosel. Mm -hmm. Nice to yes, see you. Yes, thank you. Thank yeah. you. It's an appointment huh, for us. So it's so nice to see you. Uh, yes. Uh, again, which part? New Delhi, no? Uh, it's Mumbai. Mumbai, Mumbai. Yeah. Maybe we can tell everyone if you can write where you come from. It will be interesting beside your name. Do you know how to do that? Uh, uh, no, at the moment, no. Maybe you could worry. add it. Um, what you can do is uh, you click the three dots. Ah, no. No, me está hablando. Um, and then uh, there is a part there. There'll be a drop down menu and you will see rename. Okay, I got it. Yes. And then you say Roselle, Rebelio, and then dash, you write uh, Mumbai. Whatever. Okay. Very good. Like Angelica here. Romina, do you want to change lang yung ano, like Romina Amparado? And then you write uh, Gen, uh, General Santos, Philippines. Yes, ma'am. Noted, ma'am. Uh -oh. You know that the Philippines has 7,600 islands. And Romina lives down south. Down south of Manila. I'm in Manila okay. also, Angelica. And then now Mumbai, India. Very good, Rosel. So nice. Thank Is, you. Is uh, Ghislaine coming? I'm not sure. I don't know. Okay. I think we, we, we have to start because it's already we are already yes. streaming, so we can uh, send the sigla. Ci siamo per iniziare. Prego. Partiamo con la sigla. Sì. We're starting, okay. Good evening. Welcome to the second webinar of the cycle dedicated to the environment, which is accessible for an inclusive society. My name is Choi Funk. Some friends call me Lolly also. And I was invited to coordinate this webinar. A few words to introduce myself. I am from the Philippines, actually in Manila. I am an architect, an educator, and a community builder. I speak to you from Manila and um, behind me, I used to have a picture of a mountain, but now uh, this is our, our, um, the, our accessible environment, inclusive society uh, design, which I love very much. So um, I am a widow. I have four children. All of them are artists, a graphic designer, an architect, a writer, and a musician. This webinar, as you may already know, is part of a training and discourse to spread a culture of environmental accessibility, thinking of a world where no one, regardless of their physical or cognitive condition, encounters more barriers than may affect his mobility, limit his relationships, and prevent him from full realization as a person and as a citizen. We want a more inclusive world. Now, before I go further, I'd like to see, like to say hi to some of our friends here, like uh, Herman. Hi. Herman comes from, uh, Herman comes from uh, Belgium and he's here to uh, unmute yourself. Just to let you say hi, there okay. you go. So, so I'm, I'm uh, Herman Walters from Belgium and uh, well, I, I worked uh, for several years in a facility with severely and profoundly handicapped uh, people. Uh, for the moment, I'm retired. I'm still I'm also a father of four children, like 
like uh, like Lolia, but okay, that's another thing. Okay, fine. So okay. so there, uh, Herman and I will be helping each other, and we'd like to welcome all of you. Some we have a couple of friends from Manila, and then one from Mumbai. And Gerald comes from Ireland, or where do you come from, Gerald? We were together the other time, right? We wanted to suggest yeah. if you could, yes, if yes. you can write your name, if you can yeah. rename so that people would know where you're from. Uh, like here, you see Jensan, Philippines, and Manila, like this. There's Renzo here from Italy, who is also uh, a good friend of ours, uh, bringing ahead this program. We will wait for We'll go ahead with the program, and perhaps the others will come. There are a few things that I'd like to let you know. We are live streamed, and uh, we are live streamed on uh, YouTube. So um, while it will be so nice if we can see one another and turn on your your cameras so that we can be really among friends you feel free also because um you might not want to be beamed um uh, too publicly but uh if ever you will say something like this would like to also see you when uh, yeah if just in case because we will have a moment of uh, of exchange and then um um, there are many ways for us to be in touch, but uh, let's go ahead with the program. And as we go along, we will bring you to where, how we can ex make exchanges. So again, we, we begin on this second part of our journey, reflecting on um, this, this, uh, this challenge that we have to make an inclusive um, society. So uh, what do we do now? We'd like to watch something. And uh, when we'd like to, just like the other time that we have seen a, a film where we are introduced more into this reality of a world that is not very much inclusive. We'd like to build that right now. We will now instead see two persons who are very much into this work of, um, of uh, building a world that is more inclusive. But after that, we'd like to have a discussion among us so that uh, we can uh, learn from one another. Because as you can see, we come from different parts of the world and there's much to learn, okay? So there, maybe we can ask uh, our friends or the technical team to take it away, over to you. I'm Renzo Andrik from Belluno in the north of Italy. I'm about six feet tall. I wear glasses. I have silver hair as befits my age, 66. I'm talking to you from my studio and behind me there is a white wall. I am married to Lucia and we have four children. I'm an engineer. And for over 40 years, I have been working in the assistive technology field products supporting people with disabilities in daily life, such as prostheses, wheelchairs, information technology tools, home adaptations, in short, everything that is useful to people with disabilities to improve autonomy and quality of life. For over 37 years, I have been working as responsible for research activities in this field in a large organization, which is based in Milan, Italy, the Don Carlo Gnocchi Foundation providing care, rehabilitation, and social services to people with disabilities. I am Stefano Maurizio from Venice, Italy. I am six feet tall, five feet when seated. I'm 61. I also have silver hair, as Renzo says, but much less than him. I am married to Mariangela, and we have a daughter. Oh, I forgot, I use a manual wheelchair to get around since I had a car accident many years ago. I'm an architect and I run a professional studio with some colleagues. In everything we design, we try to implement the principles of the so-called universal design. A design that takes into account the needs of all the different abilities of each person. The experience has taught us that meeting the needs of people with disabilities or elderly people helps improve the overall quality of the environment for all. We have worked at supervising many public works. 
We also provide consultancy to adapt private homes to support autonomy of each person with disabilities. Well, in this conversation, we would like to offer to your reflection some basic concepts on accessibility. How the physical environment around us can contribute to autonomy, to relationships, to quality of life of the person who has limits in one's physical, sensory or cognitive abilities for congenital causes or as a result of trauma, of a pathology or simply of older age. A well-known Italian journalist, Franco Bompresi, profound connoisseur of the disability world, also because he himself has been in a wheelchair since birth, in the introduction to a technical manual on architectural accessibility, wrote as follows. If I were Beelzebub, the devil, and I had to decide which category of people to place in the darkest and terrifying part of hell, I would certainly put architects and engineers. Do you know why? Because they are the main culprits of our disability. They are the ones who build those barriers that hinder our life. Stefano, what do you think? Basically, it is true. Beyond the metaphor, Franco told the truth that perhaps is not yet fully understood. We all have some limitations in our motor or visual or auditory or intellectual or relational skills. We all use technologies to overcome our limits. For example, the car. How could we cover certain distances by walking? Or the mobile phone, how would we communicate remotely? So who is disabled? One, for example, who, like me, has a limited ability to move compared to the population average, and thus has to resort to special tools, which we call technical aids or assistive technologies. When the mainstream tools and environments are not designed according to universal design criteria. In fact, the limit is not in itself a problem. It is a constitutive experience of any person. We all experience it sooner or later in certain moments of life, especially when we are elderly. Even less should it be a problem today with all the technological possibilities we avail. So it is society that, with its barriers, makes disability a problem. Society is the first sick that we technicians, architects, engineers, designers are called to cure. Disability is not an attribute of the person. It's rather a situation in which I can find myself whenever my limits conflict with a barrier. Not surprisingly, the World Health Organization speaks of disability as opposed to functioning. And the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities speaks of person with disabilities, highlighting that first of all, there is the person in all its dimensions, and that disability arises at the moment in which the person interacts with barriers. Yes, let's take an example. Let's think of a mobile phone. I want to make a gift to an elderly relative of mine who likes to communicate with me. But due to the ailments of age, has difficulty seeing, hearing, and manipulating with the hands. So I'll look for a mobile phone that can be easily handled with a screen that is clearly visible and bright, with large illuminated and embossed keys, with a loud tone of the ring, and maybe even with few functions only those that are really useful to her. So when she wants to call me, she will be able to do it with no effort, autonomously, with this, and I will not put her in trouble when I call her. Let's suppose instead of giving her a smartphone, more modern and elegant, small, flat, black, with many buttons and icons and apps that require refined and precise gestures for their operation. She'll probably take a while to answer my call before being able to take and hold it. To understand from a small text who is calling, to touch in the right place and direction to take the phone line, 
and so on. In the first case, the mobile phone will be an enabling technology. In the second case, a disabling technology. We could say that the former is a good gift for mom, the second is for the mother-in-law. Of course, it's a joke, but let's keep it in mind because it helps us remember the concept. There is also a useful motto, which has been circulating in Europe for some time. Good design enables, bad design disables. That is, what is well designed makes people able. What is badly designed makes people disabled. We can have an enabling environment or a disabling environment. If I use a wheelchair, I will be perfectly independent in mobility until I find a barrier. For example, a staircase or a ramp that is too steep or slippery or dangerous. If I have deafness, but wear a hearing aid that is well adjusted to my needs, I have no problem with communicating unless I am in an environment which is full of echoes and reverberations. Hence, the environmental characteristics, accessibility, safety, noise, lighting, ergonomics, etc., have a decisive impact on the person's ability or disability. Stefano, could you give us some examples? Yes, of course. I give three examples, one in urban planning, one in public transport, one in private construction. The first example concerns my city, Venice, which is an architectural gem, but which we can also imagine as a unique great architectural barrier. Think, there are 121 islands connected by 436 bridges. Making Venice accessible to everybody is a great challenge. Fortunately, there was a period when accessibility had been placed at the center of mobility and housing policies. A complicated challenge due to the complexity of the historical heritage and the amount of protected architectural monuments, which are also somewhat fragile and need care by architects and engineers. A matter of mending and mending, which makes our work truly fascinating. We started from considering that today and even more tomorrow, Within a framework of sustainable mobility, more and more people move and will move on wheeled vehicles. We are not just talking about wheelchairs for people with disabilities, manual or electronic, more and more advanced as time passes. We also talk about electric scooters, skates, skates, pedal assisted bikes, and typical of Venice, for example, the trolleys to carry clothes, luggage or carts to transport any kind of goods from refrigerators to demijohns of wine. Well, every step, even the smallest one, is a major obstacle. Hence, the decision to equip the bridge stairways in some urban path with removable ramps suitable for any type of wheel. We proceeded in a participatory way, starting from an architectural project. The municipal administration built a 1-1 scale prototype of a ramp in order to find out the best dimensions, slope, width, thickness of the handrail, and material structure, walking surface, parapet. When evaluating this prototype, together with the designers, representatives of the main associations of people with disabilities were invited along with the various responsible people for the building, landscape, history, and art heritage of the city. Together, it was possible to carry out live trials of the ramp with various types of equipment, manual wheelchairs, electronic wheelchairs, walkers, trolley, rubber bottom shoes, leather shoes, and in various weather conditions, dry ramp, wet ramp. This led to shared choices while respecting the reciprocal roles and responsibilities and personal or social needs of everybody who participated in the evaluation. A circular section steel tube was chosen for the handrail with a diameter of 45 millimeters, 
fiber cement slabs were chosen for the flooring because it was the only material among those tested which fulfilled all requirements of mechan mechanical resistance, lightness, ease of assembly, and impermeability to the typical saline mist of Venice while remaining non-slip at the same time and maintaining natural and neutral color. A steel mesh was chosen for the parapet with a visual effect of transparency, almost watermarked. Many bridges have been equipped in this way, and we notice that most of the people walking prefer the ramp to the steps. This confirms our initial hypothesis, that if we start from the needs of the people with various types of disabilities, the overall quality of the city is improved for the benefit and the ease of use for all citizens and ecological sustainability. Interesting. And listen, the second example, the one concerning public transport. Yes, again in Venice, in the mainland metropolitan area, the electric tram was recently introduced as a new means of public transport, serving the metropolitan hinterland, but also arriving up to Roma Square, which is the gateway to the historic center on the lagoon. In addition to the adopted benefits of the environmental sustainability, zero carbon dioxide emissions, the tram gave excellent results also in relation to accessibility. The vehicle moves on a monorail, which is placed flush with the asphalt and has a very low floor, 22 cm. It allows a very easy climb for anyone, thanks to the stop platforms, which are perfectly co-planner with the vehicle. In turn, connected with the sidewalks with a very limited slope. The vehicle and the stops are equipped with sound and visual signals, which are easy to understand, with an indication of the stops both inside the tram and in the stop platforms. That can also be used independently by people with visual impairment or blind or deaf, or simply with the physical difficulties that are common among older people. Having had to renovate a large part of the tramway road structure, the opportunity was taken to make all pavement accessible for about 22 kilometers, corresponding to the entire tram route. These seem to me to be very clear examples to say that accessibility improves functionality, sustainability, the beauty of the city, the pleasure of living there, and multiplies the aggregation spaces. Instead, in relation to the private home, the personal life space, what can you tell us? Mrs. Manuela comes to mind, who has a progressive disabling disease, multiple sclerosis. Today she walks with a walker and probably in the future, she will have to use an electronic wheelchair. Her house is near a river with high embankment with the road passes. The access path featured a steep downward slope to get from the street to the garden, and then two steps uphill to access the porch and the entrance door. In short, an ups and downs, which is increasingly difficult for her to deal with independently. Fortunately, the inside of the house is all on one floor. We solved a problem by creating a new pedestrian path that from the height of the road, by raising the pedestrian gate, reaches up to the entrance to the house. In this way, the steep descent and the two steps were eliminated in one fell swoop. Today, the path has a non-slip pavement and is equipped with a handrail and has a very slight slope, around 2%, which can be tackled in an easy, safe and autonomous manner, both with a walker or possibly with a wheelchair. The difference in height between the path and the garden was then connected with topsoil, where the lady plans to plant roses, a great passion of her. All in all, a very simple intervention and relatively inexpensive. We can say that when we are confronted with the individual needs of a person with disabilities, in addition to the above mentioned universal design principles, you need to take into account many other details.
the clinical condition, age, habits, the assistive products used now and planned in the future. It sounds more complex. It's actually easier because we design together with the client, working together to achieve the maximum autonomy as possible. Thanks, Stefano, for these examples. Today, among other things, we are witnessing a growing integration of architecture and engineering. The built world is full of technological objects who are aware of our presence, geolocated, able to interact with us, perhaps recognizing our voice, our face, our footprint connected in the internet cloud linked to the artificial intelligence algorithms able to translate from one language to another, to foresee certain of our intentions and to solve problems in advance, sometimes connected to each other through the so-called Internet of Things, which connects objects. Let's think about the self-driving car, which is no longer science fiction. A matter of a few years, and it will be usable by those who cannot drive today. All this opens up new scenarios in terms of social security and vulnerability, of course. However, it also opens never before seen possibilities of making every space or object usable effectively by everybody. Basically, with the technological possibilities we have today, there are no more excuses not to consider the universal design as a true design standard. Absolutely, yes, Renzo. However, let's remember one thing. However much progress can be made in terms of environmental accessibility, this alone is not always enough. Often the person has to make a step of adaptation to the environment by acquiring appropriate technologies the so-called assistive products, which in Italian we called auxili. Here too, the technological development offers solutions that were once unimaginable. However, not everywhere, and not for everyone, they are available. Renzo, you have always dealt with this issue, and you also chair an international information network on assistive technology. Can you give us some examples? Yes, of course. A wheelchair, a lens, a white cane, a hearing aid, a com communicator, a stair climber, a handrail, or even simple tools such as adapted cutlery or a pill dispenser for people with memory difficulties. They are all examples of assistive products, tools that are essential to promote autonomy and the dignity of people, to support participation in school at work and in society. Without the right assistive products, those with motor, visual, auditory, or cognitive limitations are exposed to marginalization. In certain countries where there is no social security system, they may run more risk of poverty. They may require a great deal of care by their families and communities. In many areas of the world, unfortunately, many people still encounter great difficulties in having the assistive products they need. It is therefore necessary to invest more in research industry, in specialized services with trained staff able to help the persons identify the products suitable for their situations, to acquire them, to personalize them, to learn how to use them, how to manage them. The World Health Organization is trying to speed up all these processes, having recently defined the assistive products as the fourth pillar of health strategies. Therefore, of equal strategic importance as drugs, vaccines, and medical devices. However, many assistive products are still unknown to a large part of the population. Sometimes they are only available from small specialized companies in some corners of the world. Fortunately, in many countries, a great help is offered by specialized internet portals and internationally by the information network you mentioned, the Eastern Network, which is a great example of international collaboration in this sector, involving about 30 countries. 
Good. Let's recap what we have said so far in four concepts. First, disability is a situation rather than an intrinsic characteristic of the person, a situation that arises when my limit meets a barrier created by society. Two, good design enables bad design disables. Good design, know that universal design is good design, produces ability, while bad design produces disability. Three, accessibility, when well designed, improves the quality of the environment for all. Accessibility is functionality, sustainability, beauty, relationality. Four, assistive products are essential to support autonomy. Anyone who needs them must have the opportunity to know and have them. Perfect. Then let's come to the conclusions. Accessibility is not just a technical issue. It is a language by which the environment tells me, you are included, you are excluded. It is an interdisciplinary cultural challenge which involves many responsibilities, politics, civil society organizations, social and health services, industry, tourism, education, art, communication, etc. Within this framework, we technicians, I'm talking about architects, engineers, designers, but also of computer developers and web designers, we are entrusted with a particular responsibility. We technicians have the power to build new barriers, and this will inevitably happen if we design a building or an object or device in a traditional way, and we think later how to make it accessible. For example, we design a school from scratch with a staircase on, on the main entrance, and then we make a separate entrance for the disabled, thus creating a separation that does not exist in nature and that social ethics does not want. However, we also have the opposite power, that is to create accessibility. And this happens if we include accessibility among the initial requirements of the project on an equal footing with safety, functionality, energy sustainability, aesthetics, etc. Certainly legislation, standards, technical regulations are very helpful. Many countries, including our own, have excellent laws. However, legislation alone is not enough. It only serves to establish common starting points, to solve complex design problems, to do good design. It is not enough to be simple executors of a norm. It is necessary to engage all the competence, creativity, the innovation capacity that the arts of architecture, engineering, design are capable of expressing, provided, however, that we are constantly listening carefully to the people's needs. Constant searching for increasingly effective solutions, continuously reevaluating our way of operating. So the idea of an accessible environment, of a world where no one, regardless of their physical or cognitive condition, encounters architectural or technological or social barriers that they may affect their mobility, limit their relationships, prevent from self-fulfilling as persons and as citizens, should no longer be confined in utopia. Oh no, today with the means and knowledge we avail, this dream or utopia must become reality. It is a prerequisite for the realization of an inclusive society. It is part of the integral ecology we want to pursue. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for your attention. What an amazing intervention. And of course, we have to thank also one of those who are speaking is like among us, this Renzo, and thank you so much. Um,
you know, friends, uh, we are here and we're not a lot. And so how nice it would be if you can take advantage of this time to also uh, share what our impressions are of what we just watched. I think some of us here are designers, architects, and um, we are all very much involved in, um, in creating the built environment. Uh, there are very strong points that we have heard in the intervention, stuff like uh, disability is a situation whereby we can control it, whereby we are, it is even possible that architects and designers are the ones putting barriers because of bad design. So they have said also that good design enables and bad design disables. Very, very strong points. Now, um, you have to understand that uh, this webinar has been created exactly for us to, to arouse our desire to engage in these um, discussions so that we can share. Perhaps you can think of your situation, where you're at, uh, in your country, in your place of work, in your place where you live. How, how is it with uh, disability and mobility and uh, the barriers that are put in our environment? Um, before I actually invite you to speak, which is very important, this is what this uh, part of the program is for. Um, there are some tips that I'd like to ask from you. For example, if you're not speaking yet, please uh, make sure that you are muted. If you want to share something, and please, please, please share something, um, you may please look at the, the reactions uh, uh, icon down, and then you click it, and then you raise your hand so that we know that you would like to say something and that is more orderly. And then we'd like to ask you also, if it is possible, let us say um, you want to say some more and you're, I hope you're not shy, but just in case, you can also take advantage of Padlet. And we have here in front of us, um, uh, if you click the chat, um, if you've never used uh, Padlet before, um, there's also instructions, but please click it and you are brought to a tab where automatically you will uh, find it. So this is what you will find when you click it. So there is uh, accessibility and the environment that's for Italian, but you write in any language that you please, you will see the plus sign there and a window will open and it will give you the possibility to write your thoughts. Okay, so you click that plus and then you can write. And this is what's going to appear here. So uh, um, the subject is there and then you just write, you explore. It is really uh, user friendly. Um, but if you get, um, uh, you know, find yourself in difficulty, please raise your hand and share whatever it is that you have in mind. When you share, be very open. You are among friends and whatever you share will be always a gift that you will give to us. We would like to learn from you. And then that could also be your attitude that whoever shares is someone that you can learn from. Um, again, I'd like to remind you that we are streamed in uh, YouTube. So more people will be reached by whatever it is that you will share. Um, uh, I guess that's it. But then uh, if there's something else that I will remember, I will tell you. But for now, I think it'll be very good if... Uh, Hey, Chang, uh, okay. hey, Chang, we have the second video. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So uh, just to let you know that this is still this is still something that we will talk about later on. I it skipped my mind that there's going to be one more video, so we can follow that right now. Okay, please take note. Thank you. Cedinia Siqueira tells us about her experience of personal and political commitment for accessibility and inclusion. In the course of her conversation, we will see images in her political robe, sitting in her wheelchair and speaking with a microphone. The photo of an accessible bus in a classroom, where in the foreground there is a pupil, sitting in his wheelchair, who has an accessible school desk. 
In another image, we see Sidinia in the midst of a group of blindfolded children. And finally, how she gives the trophy to athletes in wheelchairs. My name is Sidinia Siqueira. I live in Brazil, in the city of Goiânia, in the state of Goiás. I'm white skinned, I have green eyes, I wear glasses, I use a wheelchair, and today I wear a flower print blouse. I had polio when I was nine months old, and I have not been able to walk since then. I am a pedagogist, a psychologist, and I have several specializations in the field of psychology. I was a counselor for two terms in the city of Goania, serving also as a superintendent of the Secretariat of Human Rights and also of the Secretariat for Reduced Mobility and Accessibility. I wish to offer some reflections about the inclusion of people with disabilities. A person with severe disabilities is often excluded from social life. This exclusion generates a lot of problems so that the person ends up feeling inferior. Thus, I understood there was a need for legislation and sharing rights. And then I started to fight for that to happen. When I joined the council, we created an accessibility seal to try to make the importance of accessibility understood in all public places. A fleet of buses too, 100% accessible. Also menus in Braille for the visually impaired. Accessible school desks for people with disabilities. And this was part of my first law, because I had to do all my teaching in all schools, writing on a folder, resting on my legs, because there were no desks suitable for my condition. And then I saw how much we needed to ensure a decent access for people with disabilities. It was not easy. In Guayana, when I started, it was in the 90s. There was no lowered curb, no tactile floor. I actively participated in several meetings, elaborating on the Declaration of Human Rights and also on the Convention on the Right of Persons with Disabilities, so that the Convention could become a national law in Brazil. This was a milestone in the history of persons with disabilities. However, we needed to actually enforce these laws. We know that Brazil has an immense legislation which, however, is not being fulfilled in reality. It's a slow process because we must deal with prejudices. We must deal with various forms of architectural or attitudinal barriers. However, we must realize that each of us holds a responsibility for making this world better. Because if everyone does their part, for sure, everything will improve in life. Not only for people with disabilities, but the elderly, the mothers with the baby carriage will be able to use this accessibility. The disability is not inside us, inside the person. Disability lies in the way society organizes itself. I ask you, I use a wheelchair. Would I be able to come to your home and use your bathroom? Most bathroom doors are a full 60 centimeter wide. And the wheelchair does not go through. So we must bear in mind that an accessible space is a constitutional right. It is a right that the person exercises. Your right to come and go. We need to build this world in a manner that is suitable to everyone. I would like to leave a thought of mine that says, the size of democracy and citizenship is proportional to the size of a city's accessibility. Um An affectionate kiss to everyone. Very true. Very true.
everything we have seen is enough to keep us quiet but um is there anyone who'd like to say something because now is the time for it it's really really very challenging everything that we have seen right herman what do you think yes i i understand uh, the discussion of the problems and i i agree that uh, the environment has to be as as accessible as possible but sometimes i i see also in my country no but we are in fact we are a no belgium is a rich country so we have financial means to to adapt a lot of things but sometimes i see that the financial means even in my facility where i worked there was a, a, st a stair you see a stair and uh, and uh, even we had uh, people with wheelchairs. Uh, it was it was uh, not so easy to to make uh, to make uh, an, uh, a, a, a a tramp a tramp a ramp a ramp. Our ramp a ramp okay because then then we lost parking places. It was it was a huge discussion. Right. And, uh, because we, well, because also financial means maybe that's, but sometimes financial means are 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 an important thing. And sometimes you yeah, that in in that situation, it's sometimes uh, the it's not the accessibility is not possible. The adaptation is not so easy to do. But yeah. but I agree that we have to to make a society as much as accessible as possible. Okay, but the financial cost, I don't know what what what's your opinion about it. True. How about their other friends in the in the sala? I mean, what do you think? How is it in your country? What are the impediments? Is it being done? I just know that we have a lot of Filipinos here. We have we call it the BP three four four. It's it's a uh, it's a law that makes sure that everything that we design has to be uh, yeah accessible. But uh, it's just a start. We heard it in the earlier video that it is a point where we can start. But sometimes how nice it would be if without the law, we, we are still doing it in all of the things that we design. So what do you think? Do you have comments on this? You feel free, please. Um, yes, I see Renzo, yes. Uh, please unmute. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, yes. Um, in my experience, uh, the fault is uh, often given to politicians that uh, they say they are not thinking about accessibility. But uh, uh, I, as a technician uh, in my life, I have experience of many politicians of very good will. That of course, uh, of course, they they give the order. They have to make public purchasement of uh, planning from architects, from designers claiming to be expert of accessibility. They say, oh, no problem. There is a legislation. We follow the legislation as the same as for safety and uh, for security and for safety. And uh, then things are made non-accessible. <laughs> and so, I mean, I think the lack of competence is inside the technicians because in the, uh, I think, Choi, you, you are teaching a university, so you know <laughs> how, how much is taught to architects, to students in, in, yeah. the, in the university. Uh, they speak about uh, uh, classic uh, historic uh, staircases that uh, give uh, solemnity to a building <laughs> or uh, things, uh, concepts like Le Courbusier and so on. But uh, uh, the idea of uh, that uh, everything should be uh, designed accessible from the beginning is not there, is uh, always considered some a retrofitting of something uh, else and this is the big uh, uh, cultural step we need uh, to 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 do and uh, this does not depend only on the university but depends on culture in general if we if we uh, uh, um, drink from the society where we live the concept of accessibility we grow uh, with this concept in our mind and this is true in regards of people with physical disabilities, with deaf people, with uh, blind people, with people with intellectual or relational disabilities. Uh, for example, when we started uh, to organize these uh, webinars, uh, somebody raised the hands and said, oh, I am blind. If you introduce yourself 
you have to say something uh, uh, about your we... aspect. Otherwise, I can I can feel you. If we are in presence, I have some way to understand you. If we are in Zoom or in virtual, there is nothing that can uh, deliver me the impression on how you look like. So, uh, and this was something new, even if I've been working for 40 years with people with disability. So I learned it for the first time. So I think that this is not only a matter of politicians or architects or engineers. It's, made of, it's a matter of everybody, uh, of people who with disabilities who have the personal experience so can teach uh, the other people, but also person from the world of art, of education, of journalism, and so on. That is so good. I Now I realize why even in the start of your video, you were saying that I also have silver hair and I have, you know, like uh, it is really a way for us to reach out. For example, when you see the screen, this is a, this is a limit also. We're not able to be warm as much. Like if we were like in the same room, I can like press your hand and, and do that. So um, it will be something that uh, for us to discover that I have long hair and that uh, I like I like to smile a lot. And um, some of my friends have difficulty teaching because they said, I cannot smile at a black screen, especially if, like, no, I don't see faces. So um, uh, very good that we were reminded that we can also write if you are shy to share your views. You can, you see the plus sign there, click it and it'll come out. Uh, I mean, the, the, the window will come out where you, where you can share. And here, someone shared that a useful new standard is uh, uh, European Standard 2019, access following a design for all approach in products, services, and goods, extending the range of users. So this is, this is something that we can discover, um, consider in everything that we do that... Um, to make it more possible for us, right? Uh huh. Uh, we can. Uh, Jelly, would you like to share this? Uh, okay. She has, okay. Um, there is one of us here, her, and Angelica. She wrote something, and I will help her put it on the Padlet. But then, she's in a place that's quite noisy, and so she couldn't even open her uh video and audio uh do you know padlet or is it difficult are you on the phone so maybe you have difficulty also okay she she puts it in padlet there you go that uh let's read it okay so there was this filmmaking contest when i was in college and uh it means the role uh, the role of the free that's in our language we were tasked to show in film documentary the architecture for the blind. What we did was we went to the mind museum and we were blindfolded. Uh, then we realized much more than usual of being handicapped. We were not able to navigate through the space because we can't see it and reminds me that everything is not inclusive. I liked it when uh, our Brazilian friend said, if I go to your house, can I use your bathroom? Would I be able to use it? And I just felt bad for a short while. Because this is really it. I mean, and how they are not treated well, because it seems like, uh, yeah, that the disability, the limit is more external than it is uh, internal. Thank you so much, uh, Angelica, for sharing that. We can share more in the Padlet, but we can share also uh, verbally. Is there anyone who'd like to speak? Yes, Roselle. Uh, you're muted, Roselle. Good evening from India. Good evening. I would like to share certain things that affected me in a positive way and some in a negative way as a person, a person living the disability 24 seven. I would like to share a few examples from my own country, India. 
The first example that I liked from Stefano's talk was good design enables, bad design disables. Accessibility is an environment that tells you you are accepted. There are a few options or few examples I could share. In Indian railways, there are coaches that are specially made for visually impaired. And each time the train arrives, you have a sensor or a beeper that beeps for them to kind of get into the train very easily. Also a good example is the ramps. The ramps is something that I use almost every day. It's a, it's a sense of comfort, a sense of belonging that yes, I am accepted in my country. I am accepted in the environment. Another good example is also the bathrooms. The bathrooms in the malls or whenever we go out, it's, it's a difficulty. So I would like to say in my country, there are certain points where it's accessible. There are certain points where it's not. I would like to share an incident where I'd been to a, to a place called Kerala in India and I was using new crutches. Sometimes in India, it is difficult for designers to understand how we stand or how, how we need to use the crutch. Some are accessible, some are not. So as I was on my trip, I injured my hands and my feet and I had to come back home via flight. So it was difficult to come by train. But sometimes in India, the, the accessibility works, sometimes it doesn't. And I would also like to share about the song that was shared with us on email, A Million Dreams. A Million Dreams had an impact in a positive way on my life. I like the two lines that said, we may be right or we may be wrong, but I want to bring you along for the whole world I see, for the whole world, for the whole world to see, yes, yes. And another example was, however big, however small, let me be part of it all. It really sums up a person's, a person who lives the life of a disabled person 24 seven, the song really summed up what I was really feeling. Because sometimes things are accessible, sometimes they are not. And to get this environment of accessibility is really good. As a writer, I'm telling you, I would really uh, congratulate Renzo and all the people behind this webinar because it is empowering for me as a writer to write something on disability, to look at it from a new perspective, to love what I do as a writer. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roselle. That's lovely. Um, your, your openness also to share uh, it's, it's really a gift. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, yes. Um, Renzo shared the, in YouTube. You can listen to it at your own time. It's a lovely song. And they're sang by an, it is an, an Israeli band made of musicians uh, with disabilities. So they are this, uh, people with disabilities. And then they, they got this song, A Million Dreams, but they changed it a bit according to their, and it's really very strong. Thank you, Roselle, for reminding us of, of this song. So you can click it later and listen to it. You're Is welcome. There any, yes. Um, um, it's like this. You can have the, the Padlet until after today. Um, it will help us also document uh, everything that's going on here especially with you so uh please uh, we invite you even after the program because now in two minutes we're supposed to end but we also started a bit late so we have enough time for the other things we'd like to um do, do we want to read this also it would be nice to read no uh someone wrote that for our design uh okay uh, maybe i i read from Okay. It's down. Yeah, it's down. Okay, so for our designs to be really inclusive, we have to consider the disabilities that may not be physical or the disabilities that may not be seen immediately. True. As builders, 
we carry that responsibility to ensure that the spaces we create embrace all kinds of abilities and mobility and uh, abilities and mobilities. This is so true, but very uh, idealistic, really. But I think to start, to start, uh, the fact that we're talking about it, we hope that uh, the the consciousness, the awareness for it, is is born and. I hope that we would be able to spread it in everything that we write about and everything because I don't know while I was watching the film, the films, I just felt the great invitation to be a better person. You know, I, I will not even look for the rules or the, the laws, but to be very observant of my environment. How does this uh, include or does it exclude? Can people in wheelchairs go through this path? Where is the sidewalk? People have turned it into parking. And sometimes it's the reason perhaps that there are no ramps, as Herman said, because uh, people would rather have a place for their cars rather than actual people. And so um, I guess it's really for us to think about. There are a lot of wonderful technical things also. Uh, would we be able to share the that video, Renzo, of uh, your, your talk to them if they like, no? if they can communicate uh, with us if they're interested in it. Or they can watch it in YouTube. It will be available, right? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yes. <clears throat> yes, it will be stay available for, for forever in brackets. <laughs> and yes, uh, so. and I, I have to say that uh, uh, today we were uh, not so many people, we were about 15 people uh, putting together Zoom and, and YouTube. But as of the last time, uh, I saw that most people tend to look afterwards in the YouTube. In fact, the webinar of, uh, uh, of September, now it has uh, almost 2000 visualizations. So yes. it means that uh, people we look at our uh, video. Uh, is, uh, we, we see is a special difficulty with the edition in English language, I, being English international language. So it's difficult to find a, a time uh, that fits all the globe, <laughs> oh, while right. it is easier for the French, for the Italian, for the Portuguese. You're right. Yeah, so because what? we are six hours ahead. And then yeah. let's say they're on the other side of the world. But then at their own time, and that's what we call asynchronous, no? that we are not yeah. here all together. Wow. Okay. So now um, let us continue the conversation even after tonight. Um, this has been really very um, gratifying. I mean, even for me. I don't know. Maybe is there one last before we take our picture? But is there anyone else who would like to share? Because what you wrote stays on the Padlet, and we will get hold of it later. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Gerald, I see you bit moving a bit. Would you like to say something? <laughs> and they, well, uh, I, I feel I spoke too, uh, too much the last time, so. No. <laughs> That's it's why a gift. I, I'm, uh, I'm you not... want to. Uh, OK. Yeah. But you feel free. Well, the yeah, well, the, the great video there by Renzo. I it was me who put the the European standard. We were involved in developing that European standard, uh, which is is very useful. It is very straightforward. How to? It's more a process rather than most standards are very technical. This is about a design process or a design approach to how to include more people a, and it's very connected to people may know the ISO 9000 series which is kind of quality management it is kind of what industry use to promote that they have quality management systems in place around leadership how they set up their procedures etc so this standard it directly integrates into that ISO 9000 series. So, uh, but it, it is about how to include uh, particularly persons with disabilities as part of designing a, a new service, a new product or a, a new goods. So. Yeah. 
useful. So, so you wrote that one, the first one about the European standards, no? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very important. Your, your work involves uh, this, no? This is your work that you create designs for the handicapped. Well, we're, we're mainly involved in standards and education, back to Renzo's uh, remark. It is, the key part is educating a whole yes. range of stakeholders from the politicians to yes. the new graduates. I suppose that our biggest concern, our, our biggest worry is the, the built environment, as in over 99% of the built environment is built. Built, it's built already. Already. <laughs> yes. Most so maybe we can do adaptive reuse, but I guess now as we are about to close, uh, maybe it's really for us to think about how we might be able to listen better to people's needs and then respond to that um, and uh, create more ways for us to be more accessible. Um, again, I'd like to invite you to, to write on Padlet and uh, write to us about your more and more of your ideas because this is really very important. It's a big thing already that we've started this and exactly as uh, Renzo also explained earlier, uh, maybe we are just a few now, but then we have, we're creating ripples and we can uh, talk about this to our friends, post it on the social media, and then uh, let's continue the conversation. We still have two more webinars and we'd like to invite you to those again we will, we will be communicating with you. But for now, um, uh, before we end the meeting, we'd like to ask if we can take a picture of everyone so that we have a remembrance. For maybe just even a minute or less than a minute, we will ask our technical team to take the picture for us. But can you turn on your cameras if it's possible? Is that okay? So that you will just, uh, you know, see one another. Uh, is it possible for you, Romina, Cresselda, and Angelica? Is it possible? One minute. Uh, yes, no. Uh, okay. uh, there you go. Hi, Romina. Yes, and then Cresselda and Jelly. Connectivity issues. So Angelica cannot. How about you? Uh, oh, Griselda. Uh, yeah, okay, we lost her. So maybe this is good already. Uh, here we go. Wait, wait. Griselda's here. Griselda, can you turn on? There you go. Hi. Oh. Hey, LD ka nang. LD ko pala yan. Oh, sige, I know her. <laughs> but not as Griselda. Okay. So we can smile and take the picture. Smile. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Did you send us this? Okay. Okay. Yeah. One more. Me too. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, we we end here, but we we would like to tell you that uh, your your coming really inspired us. We'd like to ask if you can invite more friends to come the next time and be assured that we are going to to message you for our next meeting, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.